Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to the Honest Youth Pastor YouTube channel, the channel that helps believers use a biblical discernment in all aspects of life. Today, as you can tell, got a little bit of uh, a cold, perhaps. Um, not feeling great, but I'm here for you every week, regardless of how I feel, to do a sermon review. And today, we are going to do a sermon review that I don't think is really going to help me feel a whole lot better, but I don't know. I could be surprised. You could be surprised. We could all be really surprised. We're going to be covering a Chris Vallotton sermon from Bethel Church. So, you know, that could go well. We'll see. Um, so if you are new here and you're wondering what a sermon review is, well, each week I cover uh, different pastors from different churches, sometimes suggested by you, sometimes people I just want to cover because I just want to cover them. Today, we're going to cover Chris Vallotton. Yes, we will eventually get to Bill Johnson, but Chris came up first on the list. And so we're going to cover Chris. And uh, it, as with every sermon that we look at in these sermon reviews, there are three things that we look at. Repeat them after me if you know them. One, we look if they read the text. Two, do they use exegesis to uh, bring out context and culture and application for the modern believer? And three, do they pre preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are the three things we look for. I get it. It's a low bar. Those should be easy to cover, but they don't always get covered. So today we're going to hop into a sermon that quite frankly, I've not seen at all. I have not listened to any of this whatsoever. So I don't know how this is going to go. This, this could go great. This could go terrible. We'll see. Chris Vallotton, uh, if you want to watch this whole thing, this is an hour long without uh, my comment or commentary, a link for this will be in the description below. Also, down there is going to be our first. Fir yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I can't laugh. I'll start coughing. Um, it's a free sermon review guide. It's down there. You can check it out. Uh, it basically just walks you through the same thing that I walk through when I cover this. I use it each week uh, when I listen to my pastor preach. I use it when I'm doing sermon prep. Um, and there's that. You will also possibly during this podcast, if you're viewing this and not listening to it, See me pop a couple of, uh, of these uh, cough drops or drink uh, water out of my stern here. That's a possibility because I'm dying of this cold. So that being said, let, let's hop into it. Now that I've covered all of the problems with me, let's hop into Chris Vallotton Sunday sermon called Poverty, Riches, and Wealth. This sh <laughs> I can already tell this is going to be so good. So Lord, we just bless this night. We pray for more. We pray that you would continue to just to minister to us and open our eyes, open our spirits, open our hearts. God, we just pray you would just dramatically impact us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about poverty, riches, and wealth. And um, yeah, yeah we'll, just, we'll just have a real quiet night tonight. <laughs> Started off well already. Um. You know, uh, I've told this story several times, and I think I've put it in at least one of my books. Um, when we um, left Weaverville, we'd sold our businesses uh, to actually to our supplier. And so our auto parts supplier, who was the uh, second largest supplier of auto parts in the world, actually purchased our three auto parts stores. So the goal was for us to move to Reading and to have a couple hundred thousand dollars, that's about what we would have had out of the sale, to live for three or four years, well, um, while we build the school, and, and we, we actually came on staff for free, so we, we didn't get paid the first year, and Bethel was you know, in pretty tough financial situation, so that was kind of our plan. And we, had, um, we were in escrow for several months, and when we came to, we just decided to move instead of, you know, and not wait for the escrow to close, we just moved, and, and we were here, I think, maybe less than two months, and the people, the, the, the business, the corporation, the public corporation that was buying us actually went bankrupt. Yeah, after 18 months of escrow. Um, that, that sort of made a mess out of things, not just because they weren't buying our store, but because they're the place where we were buying our parts from. And all of a sudden, it was like a dairy, you know, it's like owning a dairy, not having any milk. And so 3,200 stores were affected, so no warehouse wanted to deal with any of us. And so obviously we haven't covered any scripture yet, but we're learning a little bit about Chris Vallotton. Apparently he was an auto port store owner. Look at that. Look at that entrepreneurial spirit. Consequently, the bottom line is we went broke. We got here two years. I mean, we got here two months, and after two months, instead of having $200,000, we owed $1.8 million. So we, uh, yeah, it was kind of, it was a little rough. <laughs> we owed 122 suppliers. 
And so um, it was pretty stressful. And we'd only been here two months, and the school wouldn't start for seven more months. So we went, to the, we, went to talk, we went in and talked to Bill, and then we went to talk to the elders at a board meeting about um, a few nights later. And I said to the board, I explained the whole situation to them in much more detail than I'm sharing here. I shared for about a half an hour our, our journey. And I said, we're, you know, we have no choice but to go bankrupt. I mean, we don't even have a wage yet. It would take us three lifetimes to pay back $1.8 million. And, um, and we owe 122 suppliers, and some of those suppliers are in Reading. So it's going to feel really awkward, you know, being someplace and having one of my suppliers walk in. It just doesn't feel like it's good for Bethel, it's, and I need to go find a job. So I got done with this whole, you know, sharing this whole story, obviously in tears. And one of the elders, the oldest elder on the team, board member, stood up, and he said, um, we're a family, and families stay together in troubled times. We don't want you to leave. And secondly, I would ask that we do, that we do one thing for you. We would like to pray for you and ask God to do a miracle in your finances. And, and I would ask that you wouldn't bankrupt for six months, that you, would give, that you would let us pray for you for six months. And I said, I have no faith for that. And he said, would you trust mine? I'm like, well, what's six months? I didn't think I was going to really trust his, but I actually was thinking, what's six months? You know, what could it hurt? 180 days. So I said, sure, you know, okay, great. Well, whatever you want us to do. And it was a very emotional night. You know, the leaders were all crying, and we were too. It was a very difficult time. Anyway, um, lots of stuff happened there. I'll just tell you a couple of them. So, I mean, I... There's lots of ways to, to start a sermon. I suppose this is one of them, obviously. Um, there are pastors that start sermons um, with stories that then will sort of act as a bridge into the text that they're preaching on. To And most of the time, if it's done well, um, it will be a parallel story to what is happening in the text. So it's basically the equivalent of a modern day version of the biblical text that you're reading. It's not... I would say it's not the best way to go about it. I think it, it makes it very person-centered, very pastor, person, me-centered sort of intro. But people do those intros occasionally. Um, that being said, I hopefully that's what he's doing. Um, we'll see kind of what he where this is going, if there's any sort of bridge or connection here. So far, we're just getting a lot of Chris Valentin history, which I mean, whatever, for what that's worth, at least we know a little bit about him. Would have never took him for a, an auto parts store owner, but there you go. And so my, my guess is that this is going to have some connection with that you have to have faith in your poverty for riches and wealth. We'll see if that turns out. I'm just sort of trying to find out how he's going to play on the title of the sermon here with the the story he's telling. Apparently, if you've read his books that he's told this story in, you probably have a much better idea of where this is going. But that's my guess. Um, two months later, we got forgiven $950,000. It was awesome. And it's like, all right, the dream is alive. We only have 850 to go, 1,000 to go. And uh, about, uh, about, I think about two or three months later, this all happened within about six months' time, um, we owed the SBA um, 200, I'm sorry, $322,000 after they had repossessed our house and taken everything that we owned. And uh, so we had made friends with the guy, the repo guy, who um, we led to the Lord in the middle of the whole thing. It was pretty, it was like the, you know, the best and worst of times. It was the best and worst of times. And he called one day just out of the blue and he said, hey, Chris, he said, I've been thinking about this whole situation. He said, why don't you make us a con an offer and compromise? I, I don't even know what that was. I said, what is that? And he said, well, you just offer some money and we'll, we'll, maybe we'll agree to it and we'll wipe the rest of your debt clean. I said, well, you don't understand. I have no money. He said, well, just, you know, make some, I said, no, you don't understand groceries? I don't have groceries for next week. He said, well, just make an offer. I said, okay, I offer $9,000. So two days later, he calls me back and said, well, they'll settle for $11,000. And they'll wipe your debt completely clear, and they'll not put it on your credit. I'm like, so I'm going to give you $11,000, and you're going to forgive 320 of it. 
They said, yeah. I said, okay, I only have one problem. I have no money. He said, we'll give you 30 days to get it. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let me repeat this. So he said, we'll give you 30 days to get it. And I'm like, all right. Oh, really cool. He called me about 14 days into it and said, how are you doing? I said, we still have no money. He said, you know, I'm praying for you. I'm like, cool, you know, new believer. That always just helps. <laughs> anyway, and then this thing happened. I, I went into the prayer chapel. Um, not in the prayer chapel. I'm sorry. We, were, we, had a, uh, we used to pray upstairs. And we were just praying up there on, a, I think it was on a, um, on a Friday night. And uh, I had got up there late, and there was probably, I don't know, 50, 60 people, and we just, you know, we just walked. Okay, so w one thing, I will stay here. I mean, again, I'm going to let him keep going, clearly. I, I have to, because this is a unedited sermon and review, so he's got to keep going. we got to see where he goes with this. But so far, we're, we're about six minutes into his sermon, and we haven't got any scripture. Um, we've just heard about his story. And this is where, like, I'm not saying this whole hour is going to be a TED Talk sort of-esque speech, but that's where some of the this terminology comes from. The TED Talks are, well, normally short or shortish talks on topics that people are experts in or subject matter experts in because of what they've gone through. And so the idea is it's very them centered, right? That's a whole Ted talk. Like, here's my story. This is what happened to me. And if you, you know, take these principles and do what I did, uh, maybe this will happen for you too. And you can, or maybe at the very least you can learn from my story and find it inspiring as well. I mean, basically the idea. And so far, six and a half minutes in, this is what we've got so far is a TED talk each sort of thing right now. Again, he's got he's got nearly an hour left. So, I mean, this could take a turn. But like when you're a pastor preparing a sermon, the the gist is, you know, I want it to be grounded, anchored, centered on what the scripture says. Now, if I do do an intro I want that to be the quickest intro possible to get me to scripture, right? Um, I don't know Chris Valentin, how he speaks, if this is kind of common for him. Um, but I don't feel like we're even close to the end of the story, six minutes in, and we haven't had anything but his story. So let's let's keep going. I just don't want to let this keep drown, droning on and on and on with no point. Walking in circles, just praying. And when I walked in the room... Bill turned to me and he handed me an envelope, what I thought was an envelope, but it turned out to be a check folded in half. And so I opened the check and it was a check for $3,000. Now, you have to understand $3,000, that's quite a bit of money, but $3,000 when you're completely and totally broke and you still owe, you know, what, $850,000, it's a miracle. I wrecked the prayer meeting. I started screaming, look, someone gave me $3,000. And Bill looked over at me and he goes, you should look again, because he'd already looked at my check. <laughs> I looked down and it was $30,000. $30,000. And the guy who signed it, I had never heard of before. Now I went nuts. You know, the prayer meeting was ruined. We were praying to mammon instead of God. Obviously joking. Anyway, it was, it was very powerful, and, and obviously, it was, three, it was three days before the, the 11000 was due, so I was able to pay the 11000 off, and the IRS off, and our, our State Board of Equalization, and those three came to exactly $30,000, I think almost to the dollar. So that was awesome. A really strange thing happened. On, on that note, really quick, I mean, I just with that story, again, I don't know a whole lot about Bethel, their backstory, Chris Valitz, and any of that. I mean, from just the very brief online stuff I've seen about Bill and Bethel. But that story at least gives you an idea of why Chris Valitzen is so, like, loyal to Bill, why he's so, like, loyal to Bethel, like, why he's, like, like rooted there. Like, I mean, he had people that were family that pulled through to, for him in a very difficult situation. And because of that, like, he loves them. And so, of course, he's going to be there. This guy, um, yeah, um, I'll just call him John, this guy, John, that gave us the money. I, I really had never met him before, and I found out who he was. And it turns out that he, had a, he got an inheritance from his father, and he had a dream. And in the dream, he saw him, he saw, he saw, God told him in the dream to give Kathy and I $30,000. So he, didn't even, he knew us just because he'd gone to a class, sat in the back, we'd never had a, a discussion, so he gave me the money. 
really cool. We got a $3 card, you know, a really expensive car. We could afford one now. And we thanked him. And then a strange thing happened. Now, this strange thing that happened, I didn't actually know it was happening until six months, until it was, until six months later. And that was that John would come in this door, and I would see him, and I would go all the way around and come in this door. And John would, would be over there. I'd go all the way around. If I see him in the hall, I would turn around and go all the way around the other way. I didn't even know I was doing it. I was con- unconsciously ignorant. You know what that means? You don't know that you don't know. <laughs> How many of you know that you don't know? Well, if you're shaking your head, then you know you don't know. And that's a higher level than you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> one day, Bill was preaching. and this, We only had one service on Sunday morning at that, at that time. And, and Bill was preaching, and he was kept circling the airport, you know, instead of... And, so, and I had to go to the bathroom so bad, and he was... He was like, and in conclusion, and in conclusion. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to pee my pants. So I finally jumped up and I ran out those double doors and into the bathroom and John was in there. But his back was to me. So I ran out the doors and I ran all the way around. And we, this is before we had Hebrews. There was a bathroom over there. I'm running all right around and then I have this thought, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, it seems obvious. You know, how many of you know that adversity introduces a man to himself? And I just got introduced to me. I went home that night and went to bed. I could not sleep. I could not sleep. I laid there. Anybody ever do this? Lay there all night thinking? And I remember this distinctly. I, I was thinking. I'm, I'm really waiting for us to get to some sort of scripture or a sermon of any kind. We're going to let him keep going, but 10 minutes of this. And thinking and thinking and thinking. And I remember... Not, I had hadn't gone to sleep, and I remember the sun coming up and starting to shine in our window, and then I had this thought, maybe I should pray about it. <laughs> I know. You know, when you're a pastor and you get paid to pray? Still didn't occur to me. So I'm laying there, and I think, now it's probably, I don't know, whatever sunrise is, probably like 5 o'clock in the morning, and I say to the Lord, Lord, I think there's something wrong with me. He said, uh-huh. I said, do you know what it is? He said, "Uh uh-huh. I said, will you tell me? He said, do you really want to know? Now, I'll spend another 50. So so this is interesting. This is something that I have heard about Chris Valentin, right? Is that um, he claims like this audible, um, having audible conversations back and forth with God. And this is just an example of it. And this is an example of people like, just understanding this is how he talks. Of course, Chris Valentin has conversations with Jesus. Why would he not? And so this is like this nonchalant in bed, you know, just laying there having a conversation with Jesus sort of thing. Now, we don't see, to be clear, like this is where we should check things against Scripture. We don't see this sort of thing in the Scriptures anywhere. We don't see the apostles um, having like anywhere recorded in the New Testament, this back and forth with the Lord. Uh, now again, there's, there's visions and dreams. I mean, we have, obviously Peter has those, Paul's has those, um, that that's an occurrence, but they do seem to be, uh, purposeful. Um, for example, the whole, you know, the, the, the cloth coming down with the unclean animals and, you know, that whole conversation with Peter, um, obviously Luke records and acts these conversations or these dreams in which, um, direct Paul where to go and not to go. Um, so they're, they're, they do happen in the New Testament, but it's not like this just nonchalant one-on-one convo. It's this reverence, it's these pivotal moments that we see happen. Same thing with the Old Testament, even though there are obviously prophets in the Old Testament that are much more specifically having conversations. Um, they're always initiated, first of all, by God. Uh, and secondly, and I mean, if I'm wrong about that, please let me know in the comment section, but just recollecting really quick on the fly here, they're always initiated by God. And it's not, again, nonchalant sort of like, hey, buddy, hey, pal. It's always this reverence of this is the Lord most high creator of all things. Who am I to be here having this conversation? And so that that should just weigh a little bit on us as we're listening to him say, yeah, I just have, you know, just lay there having a conversation with Jesus um, in this very nonchalant way when we don't have anything 
that we can be like, oh yeah, this definitely happened in scripture. I mean, even if, you know, right, you're a continuationalist and you think the gifts are still available now and they still operate now, like there's no example of what he's giving us here in the New Testament of such, you know, conversation. Even if you want to go to the early church fathers, right? Um, and go extra biblical here. There's still nothing similar to that that's happening. So he's just been like, yeah, just having a, you know, buddy, buddy conversation with God. 15 minutes trying to figure out if I really want to know, because how many know denial is a beautiful thing. And finally, I said, I really want to know. He said, here's the problem. He said, John gave you $30,000. I said, well, I, I know that part. Thank you. He said, well, you will, f- you, you will, f- you don't love yourself $30,000 worth. And you're afraid that if John gets to know you, he'll be sorry he gave you the money. Wow. You avoid him because you're afraid that if... These, these mics in the front of these churches, just, man, every time it gets me, like, wow, bro, what a word. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to start coughing. It's just crazy that people are like, yeah... Yeah, man, whatever. Let's just keep going. If he gets to know you, he'll be sorry he gave you the money because you don't think you're worth $30,000 worth, and you think that if he gets to know you, he won't think you're worth $30,000 worth either. How many of you know intimacy means into me you see? Well, I was absolutely floored. What was really shocking, which I haven't probably shared before, is this, is that All of a sudden, suddenly these, I don't know how to share this, but I don't know exactly how to say this, but. What's funny is, and this is just, again, I don't know what he's going to say. So we'll we'll all find out together in a minute. But anytime people tell stories like this, like pastors specifically, when they're like, well, I've told you about this before in my book, but I didn't mention this part. It's just like you could you could drain that story for all it's worth over and over and over again, completely elaborating on it and adding things to it over and over again. Now, hopefully, if we're being really generous, we're going to go, oh, yes, all of this is true. But then it's just one of those things where it calls into question, like, why like does this story keep getting bigger? Now, I don't. Like I said before, I've never read his books. I have no clue. He, he mentioned before that he's told this story in other books before. And so if there's this great revelation, this part that like is so powerful that he's just now revealing it to us. Yes, my cards are on the table. I, 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 I don't know if I should believe him or not. I'm, I'm a skeptical dude. I'm a skeptical dude because, again, like I said before, if I'm going to weigh what he's saying against the scriptures, there's no part in, let's go specifically New Testament, in which Jesus comes to the apostles or even the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, uh, you know, moves them in such a way where he's like, you just don't love yourself $30,000 worth. Like that's never a conversation that's had ever in the New Testament. And so then you have to say, okay, well, we have examples in scripture of how God speaks to his people and how they respond. And it's always in reverence to this God. And it's never him speaking in this way um, or even in this tone, right? So it's, again, it's one of those things where it's like, you just don't love yourself. That's never what's said ever. That's a very modern thought process. Um, the loving yourself thing is a very recent development of thought comes completely from the romantic era and this whole inward self, very individualistic. Um, that's a brand new sort of thought, really, if you're thinking about it. And so it's just weird. Let's see what, what, how he's going to tell it, what he's going to tell us though. Cause why not? We're, we're 12 minutes into this sermon. I haven't had any scripture at this point. I'm just going to bank on 50 more minutes of this video clips of my life with other Johns started flashing through my life from the time I was a little boy. And I saw that the truth is I sabotaged my prosperity from the time I was little. I was always afraid of someone who loved me too much. And I realized then, and my message is going somewhere else tonight, but you won't let, you won't let someone love you more than you love yourself. You'll sabotage your relationship with anybody who loves you more than you love you. So now we are in psychology or psychology, psychology. We are now venturing in to psychology. 
and dealing with childhood trauma that Chris Vallotton has. Jesus said, love your neighbor as. You know that word as has been, become really huge to me. That little as. Because as means the same way. Love your neighbor the way you love you. And how many of you understand that if you don't love you, you can't love them. And when you don't love you, you won't let anybody else love you more than you love you. So I spent a long time sabotaging my prosperity. And you know, in reflection, when you sabotage your prosperity, like when people give you stuff and you don't take it, you actually build a theology around poverty. I mean, because nobody goes, hey, I just don't, you know, it's very seldom that you actually know. No, let me, let me, I don't know. Let me just say it this way. I was unconsciously ignorant, so I didn't know that I didn't know. So the truth is, I never thought it was my problem. I thought it was a problem with wealth. And I'm like, Jesus doesn't want us to be wealthy. You know, there are lots of people trying to get wealthy, and they just don't follow God. And done. the rich young ruler had to sell it all. I mean, I was the guy with that message. You know why? Because I didn't really want to look at what the real problem was. So I created a doctrine. I embraced the doctrine of poverty. Thinking, I mean, consciously, I was thinking, you have to give it all up to love God. But unconsciously, I was actually afraid to look at the real issue. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. I'm going to talk a lot about money tonight. Jesus actually talked a lot about money. He actually told more parables about money than anything, any other thing in the Bible, any other thing in the Gospels. You know, um, if you write anything about wealth on Facebook, you will get a flurry of people telling you, oh, you're just that... You know, prosperity gospel, you know, sitting in the golden chair, you know, taking people's money. You know, I, I mean, trust me, I experiment with it every once in a while. <laughs> Jesus said, love your enemies, and I have to make sure I have some so I can love them. <laughs> you know, if you don't have any enemies, you're not doing anything worth resisting. That's a good word. Here's the most quoted verse on Facebook. 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, have you ever heard that the love of money is the root of all evil? I'm sorry the Bible doesn't say that. It says the love of money is the root. Let me read it exactly. Okay, so let, let's go ahead. I don't know if this is his text or not. Who knows? But he seems like he's going to be spending some time in this. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, he's going to be reading for verse 10. Let's go ahead and just really quick do a full context because I don't know if he's going to or not. I honestly don't trust him to. So let's do a full context starting at verse, um, let's see, 1, right? So 1 Timothy, hold on for a second. I just messed this up. 1 Timothy 6, um, we're going to start at verse 3. Uh, teach and urge these things. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound word of our Lord Jesus Christ and teaches that uh, and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarreling about words, which produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and com. Uh, and contrast frictions amongst people who are depraved in mind and deprived uh, of the truth, or deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with uh, with contentment is great gain. For we bought, brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothes, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many sens uh, senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So he already explains what that what he's talking about. There's this idea, it basically starts... Uh, at verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So there's this contentment you have. I have enough, 
right? I have enough. And then he sort of connects that with money. Uh, but in verse seven, for we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing with us. So there's this open handedness with what we do have, but then verse eight, but if we have food and clothes with these, we can be content. So we have food where we are not starving. We have clothes. We are uh, covered. We are comfortable. Um, and then he goes in and we're content with that. We're content with being full and covered. And then in verse nine, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. So there seems to be this above and beyond what you need to have is this desiring. It's never enough. Just being full and being covered isn't enough. I need to be, I need to continually have more and more and more. And I'm never content seems to be uh, the gist here. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, this temptation to continually chase after, into a snare that uh, many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So this desire, this temptation to be rich is full of senseless and harmful desires. It leads you into these things. And then he says, for the love of money. So it's this love, it's this desire, it's this temptation, it's this non-contentment is the root of all evil. So let's see where he goes with this. Let's see if this is sort of his root passage or not. But I think the context is important. Just verse 10 isn't enough to understand what, what Paul is telling Timothy. And honestly, it would be a better idea to have context all the way up to chapter 6. I've not read uh, first Timothy for a minute. So I don't really have the context for that. But even just these short verses three through 10, give us enough idea of what Paul's talking about that we have this a uh, good idea of this. We brought nothing in, we take nothing out. If we have food and clothes and we are content, that is good. The love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. It's not the root of all evil. It's the root of some evil. And by the way, when people quote it, they'd send it, take out the word love and just put money. The love of money is not the root of all evil. How many of you know there's lots of other things that are evil? But the love of money is the root of a evil. But how many understand that's the love of money, not money? Thank you, Chris, for clarifying that. That's all right. It'll be interesting, too, to see if he brings in any examples. I mean, from like, for example, the early church, incredibly generous. Um, we have the early Christians being incredibly generous. I don't remember what letter it is. It may be from Pliny the Younger, but the idea is that like they were known for not only taking care, they always took care of other believers first, but they were they were known for taking care of even uh, the Jews that did not like them, even the other Romans and the Greeks that did not like them. The Christians were known for being generous and content. In fact, um, I know this isn't Pliny the Younger, but there was a letter... Uh, not a letter, there was a, um, a historical account that was written in which James's relatives, so James, Jesus' brother, head of the church in Jerusalem, uh, his relatives were brought before some governor. I don't remember where. I'll try to remember if, but and link it below, but don't hold. I mean, you can probably look it up. But they were brought before this governor because they're like, if this is James, the the leader of the church, these guys are going to be rich and you know we're going to be able to tax them or something along those lines. But they brought them and they were humble farmers because they worked the ground and they were generous to everyone. And it really confused the governor because uh, they thought like if you know, this religion that's spreading crazy, like the leaders of that should be wealthy and they weren't like their, their sons and their grandsons and their family um, were just common people that did common jobs and were very generous. And I think that speaks tons for the early church and how they saw money and generosity and giving. No, so I want you to look at these verses. Would you do it with me tonight? Because you're not going to believe what you're about to hear. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Would you just read it with me? For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's go down to verse 17. Would you agree that verse 17 is still the same subject? Okay, so guys, if this ever happens, sorry, and you are jumping verses you've got to read what's in between. So let's get to 17. So 
Uh, we'll start with 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. So he's telling Timothy, don't fall into this temptation to not be content. Don't pursue riches. Um, with this, everything he said in verses 3 through 10. Fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life in which you were called and about which you were made, a good confession uh, in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all and to Jesus Christ who is the testimony before uh, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made a good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in the uh, an unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be the honor and glory and dominion. Amen. And then we get into verse 17 that he's about to reach that he says it's on the same subject. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of which... Uh, which is true life. So he's basically telling him, hey, you do these things. You are accountable to Jesus. Don't chase after uh, these riches. Don't don't be drawn away by temptation of riches, which is apparently something that Timothy could be drawn away with, that some of the church in his church are being drawn away with. And he says, like, they're going to have, you're going to have rich people in your church, charge them not to be haughty, nor set their hope on it. Like, yes, they're going to have money. Teach them not to have hope in that, but to have hope in Jesus Christ. He's the one that provides all, and they are to be generous in their good works. So he has provided the money. They're to be generous with it. Again, it goes back to the early church and how they saw money. Let's let's see what Chris says. Instruct, yes? Hello? Anybody home? Are you checking the score? Okay. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. Verse 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. He richly supplies us with all things to what? To sacrifice, to enjoy. Verse 18, instruct, those, instruct them to do good, to give all their money to the poor, and to follow me. Is that what your, verse, your version says? Oh, instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may hold that which is life indeed. So that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Did you get what I just read? Okay, that's the scripture word for word, right? Didn't add to it. How many know that most rich people were not told to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow Jesus? How many know that most, Paul, Timothy wrote to all rich people, Jesus spoke to a specific person. What did, Jesus, what did God say to all rich people? Be generous, right? Don't be conceited. Be, give, give to people. Don't trust in riches. Be ready to share and to build, and build a foundation for the future, which is life indeed. Here's my point. God told one rich guy, sell everything, give it to the poor. One time in the gospel, people make that the foundation for all people who have money. In other words, if you have money, then there must be something evil about you. I'm not sh Like, maybe he's heard that before because of maybe, like, other things he's taught. I obviously can't say, you know, this is anecdotal from my own perspective. I've literally heard no one ever say that all rich people have to sell all their stuff. In fact, most of the time when we're talking about riches, we this verse that we just read is brought up, that you're supposed to be generous in good works. Um, so maybe Chris has heard this before, um, that every rich person is supposed to. But I, I don't know. I've never heard anybody actually promote a gospel of prosperity using the rich young ruler as an example. Now, if you have that, 
link it below because I'd like to see it. But I don't know if anybody's ever taught that. And Timothy said, listen, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, the love of money is the root of some evil. And when people have money, if people who are rich in this present world make sure they're not conceited and that their hope isn't based on money and instruct them to do good and be rich in good works and be generous and ready to share. How many know that that's what you should do if you're rich? Unless Jesus tells you to sell everything, you should be rich in good works, be generous, don't be conceited, and don't trust in your money. Pretty simple, really. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. We're going to read. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Now, one of the things that happens a lot, the reason I pause this is because um, people like, I don't know if people like Chris, people will do this where they'll jump around a lot. Now, yes, this is going to make this video longer. We're literally only 20 minutes into this video. We're 40 minutes into this sermon review, but I'm going to keep doing this because I think it's valid and really important to do. He's going to start us in, in verse 5 of 13. Let's read verses 1 through that verse 5 so we can see the what? The context of what's happening. So Hebrews chapter 13 says this, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as uh, though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in body. Let marriage be held in high honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. This is repeating exactly what Paul is telling Timothy. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we have confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. There's this confidence in the Lord. The Lord's with me. The worst you can do is take my stuff. God will still provide, basically. Verse 7. Uh, I'm sorry. So we don't need to go to verse 7 because we've already done that. So he's going to go in verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and contentment. Let's see what he says. Lots of scripture tonight. Sorry, it's Bible study. <laughs> Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he himself said, I will never desert you, nor will I forsake you. What is, in that verse, what is the inoculation for the love of money? It's an open book test. Be content. How many know contentment is the inoculation of the love of money? If you're content, you're not going to chase money. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to puberty. <laughs> <laughs> okay Luke 18 18 all right once again Luke 18 18 Luke 18 18 this isn't too bad so if we start at verse 15 that's kind of the break that's probably in your Bible it says now they were bringing even infants to him that they may touch them that he may touch them. And when the disciples saw that they rebuked them, but Jesus called to him them saying, oh, I'm sorry. See, I'm skipping ahead. 18 is actually, 1818 is the first thing with the rich young ruler. Let's see what he says. Here's the second most quoted verses in, on Facebook. A ruler questioned him saying, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except for God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your mom and dad. He said, all these things I have kept from my youth. Jesus heard him and said, when Jesus heard him he say this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all your possessions and distribute to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when he'd heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, how many of you understand that if you love your stuff more than you love God, then you've prostituted your soul. Okay, well said. Did you get that? Okay, so how many know the idea is to love God and not your stuff? Hang on to your stuff loosely because you never know when God might tell you to let go of your stuff and grab onto him. I mean, to be fair, so far, this isn't bad. Like, as I, I, I wish, he would have used, wish he would use more context, but as far as... Uh, the, the one glaring red flag is the him talking to Jesus thing. 
Um, but as far as the scripture, what he's using is he has kind of pulled them all together, which is this contentment theme. So that part isn't too terribly terrible. I love Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. It's just- Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. I hate when people skip around like this. 14, verse 21. One, it makes it really hard to follow along, but they never give you enough time to get there. All right. Let's see what he says here. Verse uh, Genesis 14, 21. It's the story of Abraham. And Abraham, you'll remember that Lot, his nephew, was in Sodom. And Sodom and Gomorrah, those two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and two other cities, got in a battle with four kings, with five kings, so four kings to five kings, and the five kings, you know, won the battle, and they took Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and all of his family, they took him as POWs, prisoners of war, and when Abraham found out about it, he, he rounded up 600 men and went after five kings. We don't know much about the story except for Abraham wins the battle, rescues Lot, and when he does, in chapter, in chapter 14, the, um, the king of Sodom comes out to meet Abraham and says, listen, give us all of our people, but you can have all of the spoil. You can have our homes. You can have all of our stuff. And Abraham makes this profound statement in verse 23. I will not take a thread, a sandal, or anything that's yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abraham rich. There are times to not take money. There are times to not take money. You'll remember when Elisha healed Naaman the leper, the, that he, the leper comes back healed. Naaman comes back healed. Elisha doesn't even come out of his tent, sends Gehazi out, and the, the commander wants to give Elisha a bunch of money, make him rich. And Elisha tells the servant, tell him I'm not taking his money. So the man leaves with all of his money and all of his entourage, and Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, waits till he gets a few blocks away, then takes off after him and said, hey, my master changed his mind. He'll take some of your money. He gets a bunch of money, hides it in his tent, gets back to Elisha's house, and Elisha said, "Uh, Gehazi, where'd you go? He goes, ah, you know, I just went for a little walk. He goes, Gehazi, don't you know my heart went with you? And then he says this to him, Gehazi, it's not time to take money. And and Gehazi ends up with leprosy. My point is this, is that there are times that that God will send us a test, and we need, there are times when we have to make sure that we, we are trusting in God and that he doesn't want us to get wealthy from somebody else. I remember um, several years ago, I was uh, speaking in Bakersfield, I think it was like six sessions in three days, and I did two sessions on generosity. And so apparently he talks a lot about money. That's what I'm getting, is that he, he does some like, he does a lot of talks about money. I don't know what those talks are. Apparently he gets pushback from them. So far in the verses we've read, it is saying riches and contentment, balance those out, be content, and then be generous with those riches. So if you are, I mean, this is what Paul tells Timothy, right? If you do have rich people in your congregation, tell them God's the one that gave it to them. Don't have confidence in those. Be content and be generous. It is a fairly simple thing um, to say. Now, obviously, the the playing out of that is a bit different, um, and it's going to be different for everyone's different circumstances. So far, what he said seems to line up. He also knows uh, again, both of those uh, Old Testament stories, uh, narratives that he gave there were fairly well worked out. He clearly knows the scriptures in regards to at least those two stories. I would say probably more than just those two stories. Uh, we would differ on the fact that both of those were tests. I think both of those are examples. The Abraham one is the example of Abraham saying, no, I trust God to build me up. I don't want you to think you had a, a plan in that. And then with Gehazi, it's just him not being content and going after money. Uh, both, I think, again, do seem to you know, be within the theme of what he's talking about so far, which is the contentment and trusting in the Lord. Um, So far, nothing he said, except that beginning part where he said that, you know, I had a conversation with God um, is really off kilter. Now, again, if you're this far in, I'm just looking at the time here. We're only 20 minutes into an hour. I know we're 50 minutes into this. I'm so sorry. We're going to be here for a minute. Let's, let's go.
when, uh, when I got done with the second session, they, this church was going through a really hard financial time, and I just felt like I was supposed to speak on generosity. And um, when I got all done uh, with the message, I sat down, and the Lord said to me, you'll not be taking an offering from this church. I said, why not? He said, you can't teach on generosity and then benefit from it. That's manipulation. Well, what I didn't know is they, had, they were in the green room while I was, when I finished the message, and they, as leaders, decided to take a first fruits offering and give me the entire offering. The largest offering in the history of their church, 18 year history of their church came in that day. They took me in the great room and they gave me this, they, they took the offering and they said, we wanna give you this money. I said, God told me that I couldn't take an offering, I couldn't take any money from you, that if I was gonna preach on generosity, that I couldn't have it benefit me. How many know there are times there are times when you can't take the money. You know how Abraham got rich? Other kings gave him money. But when, when the king of Sodom wanted to give him money, he said, it's not time to take money. It isn't a rule, but God will often test your heart. That's a good word. <laughs> Luke chapter 16, turn there with Luke chapter 16. Let's see where we're going here. Again, it's, it's, I just want to keep reiterating that anytime a pastor goes anywhere, you want to at least, I know you're not gonna be able to pause him like we are in real time, but go write it down so you can double check it later. Luke 16. I'm not sure the verse yet. Would you? Verse nine, Jesus said this, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. I want to talk about that for just a minute. I, you know, I play, uh, I've played basketball at the YMCA for 17 years. The problem is I'm really stink. Like I'm not, I'm not very good at all. Okay. So here's an example I think will be really beneficial for us. He could have read verses one through, uh, one through nine, which would have been the basic context of this, which we still may do. I want to see, I want to give him the chance to do that. I have a feeling that he's going to tell a story that he feels ties in with verse nine and not read any of the context of what Jesus was telling. This is the parable of the dishonest manager, by the way. Um, but let's see what he does. And so the first 10 years I played there, there was a bunch of other guys who weren't very good at either, and we got along fine. <laughs> then about seven years ago, some young guys, they're, they're mostly young guys anyway, but some young guys who could really play and who were serious about the game, they started coming down at, on Mondays and Fridays, the day I play. And they, and pretty soon, within about a few months, I was, they were kind of like, okay, who wants Chris on their team? And it was kind of like, yeah, and Chris was sitting a lot. <laughs> and about a year into that, a couple of, they started to draw some really good guys, and pretty soon, they were kind of like, you're not playing. And when I would play, they would throw the ball at me, and three times they knocked me down in one year, standing over me, on purpose. And I would, walk, I can't, I would come home, for about a year crying on Mondays and Fridays. And Kathy would say, why don't you quit basketball? I said, no, no, now I'm staying. <laughs> She's like, you need to play golf. I'm like, I'm not old. I am not playing golf. I know it's not an old man's game, but. So I was, one day I came home, I was coming home from the gym and I was really, the guy had knocked me to the ground and stood over me and he's like, get up, get up. And I'm like, I wish I was 10 years younger right now and I'd lay hands on you and pray about it later. <laughs> I left that day, I was really, really grieved. And I'm like, okay, maybe Kathy's right, maybe I should quit. And I felt, and I, and I went home that day and I happened to be reading the book of Luke and Jesus said, make friends, <laughs> make friends for yourself with unrighteous mammon. I'm like, that's money. I should make friends with money. So the next week, I went down, and I found the most influential guy. He'd been coming for several years, and everyone loved him, and he was the best basketball player in the whole, at the Y. And, and he was broke. And I always watched him negotiating for his membership. You know, like he'd come in, they'd be like, oh, you know, I don't have any money. Why don't you let me in? And so, he was go so I'd walk past him as he was negotiating how he was going to get in that week. So I just went in, and I paid his year's membership. I didn't tell him, I just paid for it. So that week was still bad. The next week I come back 
like on a Friday, and he's like, comes right up to me. He goes, hey, did you pay my membership? I'm like, yeah. He's like, wow, man, why'd you do that? I'm like, ah, just felt like I should. Making friends, influencing people. <laughs> I'm sitting on the sideline like I always do, you know, waiting for somebody to, who isn't violent to invite me in. <laughs> and my friend's like, hey, come play. Hey, you guys, let's, let's have Chris on the team. From that day forward, I was like the most popular guy on the court. They're like, oh, I'll take Chris. No, no, well, he's on our team. I paid for two other guys' membership who were violent. I figured I'd need someone to protect me. I've been going now for seven more years. I am beloved there. I walk in, I'm like, hey, 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 let Chris play. He hasn't been here much. Thank you. Luke 16, 10, he who's faithful in very little and a very little thing will be faithful also in much. He who, is, he who is unrighteous in a very little thing will also be unrighteous in much. You know, some of you are like, you know, if I had a lot of money, I'd give it away. Jesus said you wouldn't. Jesus said the way you deal with your little is the same way you'll deal with a lot. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust true riches to you? It, it, very simply put, he's saying, if you're not good with money, if, you're, if, you're not, if you don't deal well with money, who's going to entrust spiritual stuff to you? Okay, so let's go ahead and read the, all of it, because I, here's my point. I just want to use this just as an example. So let's read this through, and then I'll explain. So verse 1 of chapter 16 in Luke. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charge, uh, charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is that, uh, this that I hear about you? Turn in your account to your manager, for you can no longer be a manager. And that manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking that management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what I will do. So that uh, so that when I am removed from management, people will receive me into their houses. So summoning his master, his master's debtors one by one, he said to them, how much do you owe the master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commanded the dishonest manager or commended, uh, the dishonest manager for his shrewdness for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their dealings with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwelling. One that is faithful in a very little little will also be faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in a very little will also be dishonest as much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? Riches, And if you have not been uh, faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will devote uh, to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The example that I want to draw out is that Chris could have went through and actually exegeted the verses one through, I mean, he could have done the whole thing, right? We could have done this whole thing one through 13 and shown how the people of this world are far more shrewd with their money than believers are. And because of that, they advance and they they know how to interact with people and they befriend people in ways, um, even if they're dishonest, they still get uh, advantages in their dishonesty. And we could have exegeted the whole passage and shown how Christians used to say, like, you can't serve both God and money, but you should be shrewd. Like, take the principles they're applying and then use them for godly ways. And we didn't go through and exegete all of that. He used an example of himself um, and uh, of how he made friends by paying people off, uh, essentially paying people off, uh, and to, to draw out verse 9 instead of actually going through and teaching through the teachings of Jesus saying, Hey, the people of this world 
are very shrewd with how they do things when they're backed into a corner. Believers aren't. And so how can, as Jesus tells his disciples, how can we be shrewd with what we're doing, knowing that it's not ours in the first place, as even unrighteous people are shrewd with their own, with other people's money so that, because they know they're, they're responsible, they're going to be responsible for it. So they're shrewd with it in dishonest ways. How can you be shrewd with it in, in righteous ways? Uh, but we didn't do any of any of that. And that's the example I want to draw out. Lots of times you'll hear people tell personal stories instead of actually exegeting the text and they'll only read one verse. And I would say that even if you get to the right answer in the wrong way, it's still the wrong way to do it because you could have gotten a much deeper teaching by actually working through the text. I didn't say it, Jesus did. If you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give you what is your own? How many of you would like to own your own house? Take care of your apartment. Wow. Yeah. Kathy and I took this verse to heart it went since we were young. And we know every time we've rented, we always leave that place better than we got it. In fact, we always have done repainted the place. We leave it immaculate because Jesus said, if you take care of what's another's, I'll give you your own. No one can serve two masters, for either we'd hate the one or love the other, or else he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The actual word there, word there for wealth, there's actually three words in the Greek for wealth. This word is actually the word mammon. It's actually not talking about the, directly money. It's talking about the spirit of money. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God and the spirit of money. You can always tell who you're serving, especially during the offering. If you're trying to protect your money, you know who you're serving. Money is influence, power, and provision. The way you handle money is a manifestation of your heart. It is the way you deal with influence, power, and provision in every other area of your life. If God is your master, then money is your servant. But if money is your master, then, then you are its servant. I wish I had more time because I'd like to talk a little bit more about that. You understand that if, um, if, if, look at, this is what money is. Just think about this. If, um, if I fix cars, and Eric builds houses, and I, need, and, I, and I need my house built, but he doesn't need his car fixed. How many you know, we don't have anything to trade. I need what he has, but he doesn't need what I have. Are you with me? I understand this is super simple. So, you know, so what is currency? So, so you know, somebody, in, you know, thousands of years ago invented a currency. So Eric can, you know, Eric can fix my house, and because he doesn't need his car fixed, then I will give him currency, which is not in itself worth anything. It's a, it is a, if you will, it's a security note for my labor, which he doesn't need, which he can pass off to somebody who needs my labor, and so on and so forth. I'm saying those dollars, or however you do it, that check, it's worth nothing except for the labor, the, the work, my life's work, that's, those dollars actually represent my life's work, which he doesn't need, so he passes it off to somebody else because I need his life's work, but he doesn't need mine. So he passes my life's work off to someone who needs it, and therefore he gets something else that he needs. I just want to bring this out real quick. We're halfway through the sermon, by the way. I know we're only 30 minutes to an hour, and we're at an hour mark, but bear with me, please. I think the reason some of this is so long, minus the fact that I'm interrupting and talking a lot, is stories like this. Like this unfolding of... Oftentimes, you'll hear pastors say things that sound very helpful. And sometimes they are helpful. But they are, by themselves, not really connected to the thing we're talking about. They could be completely separated from the scripture and still be valuable and not be connected to Christianity at all. And so this idea of currency and passing on currency and value and wealth and trade, all of these things are very interesting topics, but they don't necessarily have anything to do directly with the text we're talking about. There's there's a lot of texts, as I've already said, that Chris has brought up that I think have been very helpful, and he's handled them fairly well, I think. Uh, but we're, we have all of this sort of fluff on the edges that we could have taken that time, cut out the fluff and the stories and actually use it on exegeting the passage, which we haven't done. What I'm getting is what I'm getting at is that those dollars, they represent my life. <laughs> are, are you with me? They represent my life. So what I do with my power, provision, and influence with those dollars 
is actually what I do with every other part of my life. That's why you can look at what you do with your money and, think, and know what you do with the rest of your life because money is actually the currency of your life's labor. Are you with me? So when you, let's say you, let's say you give $1,000 to Bethel or whatever you give. You give $1,000 to Bethel, you give $1,000 worth of your life's energy, effort to Bethel because you can't, you, because you can't keep the lights on. You can't pay for, you can't keep the air conditioning on. You can't pay, you can't, you can't give Eric what he needs to live on and Chris what he needs to live on, so you give $1,000 worth of currency, which is actually $1,000 worth of your effort so that Bethel could take that currency and give it to the electric company to get what they need and the, light, and, the life, and, and, the, and the beat goes on. You get the idea. I'm saying the currency is actually, it actually represents, it actually, if you will, in a bigger way, it actually is your life's effort. So you can look at what you do. Like, I would encourage you, go look at your checkbook or wherever, however you, you spend your money. Look at that. You can say, this is how I'm actually spending my life's effort. Is what I say I believe and what I actually believe congruent? I mean, he could have just really simply said, where you spend your money is what you actually worship. That would have been a really simple way to... And, and honestly, I, I would even condense it down further. What you spend your excess time on is what you're putting your time, effort, energy, and worship into, right? So obviously, you're going to pay electric, you're going to pay house, you're going to pay car payments, you're going to pay insurance, you're going to pay all this. Those are the things that are basically unavoidable. So those things aren't really... Those are just care and provision for your family and yourself. Everything above that, as far as, you know, do you pay uh, tithes to your church? Um, do you... Uh, pay tie. Do do you do you give generously to other people? Do you give generously to organizations? Do you have time that you give to other people? Like those are the things that actually like your free time and free money. That actually shows what you care about. Like that demonstrates that. And I would say a lot of people at this point, at least, I mean, speaking for all the people I know, don't have a lot of that extra time, time effort, or money. Um, but what you devote yourself to is what you care about. This is a really simple way to say what he just said. Are, are you following me? So Jesus said the way you deal with money is actually the kindergarten for everything else. And he said, who's going to trust you with your currency of your life? Who's going to trust you if you don't spend your currency of your own life well? Who's going to trust you with spiritual things? See, he can say that because currency is really your life's effort. Now, somebody, you know, people always say, well, you know what? Wealth isn't a sign of spirituality. Well, it's not unless it is. <laughs> I understand the prosperity gospel and all of that stuff, but I, here's what I'm, I'm saying. It's not a sign of prosperity unless it is. You're like, well, that's confusing. Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. All right, so Genesis chapter 3, verse 2. This, this is the part that I guess could get interesting, right? Because now he's trying, at least, to differentiate himself from the prosperity gospel. I forgot what he said we were going to. No, Abraham was rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. How did he get that way? because God blessed him and prospered him. In other words, Abraham's livestock, silver, and gold were actually directly related to the fact that he had a relationship with God. Okay, it's gonna get worse. Okay, so hold on, this is interesting because what that means, so he's making, or he seems to be making a correlation because this happened to Abraham, then this is an example for everybody. Even though before he said that what Jesus said to the rich young ruler wasn't for everybody, it was just for the rich young ruler. So which one is which? We can't play both sides of this coin here. Isaac, Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and the man became rich, and he continued to grow richer until he became very rich. Okay, let me read it to you again. Now Isaac sowed in the land and reaped a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Why did he reap a hundredfold? Because the Lord blessed him. And then he got rich, and then he got richer, and then he became very rich. 
okay, can you tell me that his riches weren't related to his relationship with God? Yeah, the prescriptive versus descriptive text. This is very simple. So he's trying to differentiate himself. Uh, we finally got to the meat of it, 35 minutes in, I guess. So he's he's trying to differentiate himself from the prosperity gospel. This seems to be the rub. is that He, he says he understands the prosperity gospel, but prosperity is connected to your relationship with God, even though before he said that, well, just because Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell everything doesn't mean everybody should. So he obviously understands prescriptive versus descriptive text. Yet, now he's going to the Old Testament to Abraham and Isaac and using descriptive tracts to be prescriptive for everyone with a relationship with God. It does say God bless them. God can choose to bless whoever he wants to. It doesn't say God will bless every person. Um, these These are descriptive situations of specific people that had relationships with God. Also, I would argue... These, this is a purposeful thing in the lineage of Christ to bring forth the Messiah. But let's keep going. The Bible says it was. <laughs> the Bible says the reason Isaac got rich wasn't because he was a good businessman, but because God blessed him. So he kept getting richer and richer and richer. I'm saying riches aren't connected to spirituality unless they are. <laughs> Ruth married a guy named Boaz. And what's the commentary on Boaz? He was very rich. Ruth chapter 2 verse 1, he was very rich. I didn't say it, God did. Second Chronicles chapter 1 verse 11, Eric uh, read this some time ago. God said to Solomon, because you, because you had in mind and did not ask for riches, wealth, honor, or the life of those that you hate, and you have not asked for long life, but you have asked for yourself wisdom, knowledge, that you may rule my people over whom I made you king. Wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you. And I'll also give you riches and wealth and honor, such as no kings before you have ever seen, no, ever, no king after you will ever possess. I just read it word for word. So there's this confusion that he's making here that just because the Bible says it, it therefore is prescriptive in general. So even in what he just read, like there seems to be this really distinct line between the first 30 minutes of this and what apparently is going to be the rest of this, is which all of the verses he read before, from, from for example, Hebrews and Timothy, were very much like, hey, be content in what you have. And if you are rich, be generous with those riches, knowing that your contentment is in the Lord. He just reads about Solomon. Solomon didn't want a whole bunch of things, but God goes, because you didn't want them, I'm, I'm going to give them to you anyway. Why? Because apparently he was content in just having the wisdom of the Lord, and then God decides to give that to him on top of it. Again, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. And we know that Chris knows the difference because he's already utilized those definitions before. And he didn't say them out, but like when he was talking about the rich young ruler, they were convenient to use then, but not now, apparently. What did God say? God said, listen, Solomon, because you asked for wisdom and honor. No, because you asked for wisdom to rule your people, to lead your people. Instead of riches, honor, and wealth, or the life of your enemies. I'm going to give you the wisdom you asked for. I'm also going to give you riches, honor, and wealth. <laughs> that you're going to be richer, have more honor, and more wealth than any king before you, and any king who ever comes after you. <laughs> now, how many know that his riches, honor, and wealth were directly related to his relationship with God? No, that is not what's happening. God chose to, it is not directly related to his relationship with God. It was directly related to what God wanted to do when God wanted to do it. it that is a really weird twisting of what's happening there in order to make it say something that it's not. In all three cases, all three men had a relationship with God. God chooses to bless each of them with riches and money. Um, but none of their relationships, therefore, equal riches and money. It is what God chooses to do individually in their lives. And again, I would argue for his greater plan um, than they have a relationship. And then therefore, of course, 
because this is the prosperity. <laughs> this is. I, I have a relationship with God and therefore he does everything for me, right? Which is just, it's crazy that he's trying to make an argument against the prosperity gospel using the definition of prosperity gospel. Spirituality is not related to wealth unless it is. When, I, when we, on our 40th anniversary, my wife, I said to my wife, what do you want to do for our anniversary? This is about a month before. She said, I want to go to Disneyland. I said, you want to go to Disneyland for our anniversary? <laughs> Seriously. Is there anybody else up there? She said, yeah. I said, okay, we went to Disneyland. We came home. It was still about uh, probably uh, a week before our actual anniversary date. She said, what would you like for our anniversary? I said, I like a yellow Corvette. She looked at me. She said, you've been asking that for years. I said, I know. I built six Corvette models as a kid. She said, all right, we're going to get you a yellow Corvette. How many know a yellow Corvette is not a sign your wife loves you? Unless it is. <laughs> Unless it is. Wow. Are you with me? I'm saying, you see a yellow Corvette drive down the road, you don't think his wife loves him. Unless he does. Proverbs. So what he just did, I don't, I don't know if this was intentional, but he directly correlate, correlated his relationship with his wife, like the love she has for him with things. And the connection that he, he's making inadvertently is the love God has for you is connected to what he gives you. That, that Again, I don't know if it was purposeful. I don't think it probably was. But the connection he makes here is that if God loves you, he demonstrates it by giving you things. Uh, monetarily, apparently, is how this is working, which is the prosperity gospel, right? <laughs> the, we don't see this in scripture, like as a blanket statement for all believers. We have, we have the apostles, we have the early church fathers, we have thousands of Christians within the first, second, and third century that are in poverty, persecuted, and killed, right? We have that in the Old Testament as well. Believers in Christ go through all sorts of persecutions. Um, sometimes prayers seemingly to go unanswered. You have all of Hebrews chapter 11, I think, right? Uh, Hall of Faith there to demonstrate that. And in that, like, it's just crazy to be like, well, God's love for you is demonstrated in the riches you have. It's nonsensical. This is it's, the poverty gospel is a joke, and it's just funny to me that he he says he understands it, and then oh my gosh, it's fine. Let's just keep going. We're going to be in Proverbs apparently. He's about to give us the you know the first half of this wasn't bad. He should have just stopped at thirty minutes. That would have been better for all of us. Proverbs what three twenty two. I'm going to kill you. You watch this. <laughs> Proverbs three twenty two. I can already hear the Facebooks coming. Proverbs 3.22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of sinners is stored up for the righteous. Who has the wealth, the righteous or the sinner in this parable? The righteous. Well, you know what? God doesn't want you to be wealthy, unless he does. <laughs> See, the Proverbs are full of very basic principles that God gives them. This is how the world works. This is how I've designed it to work. Do these things, and you will live well right? Of course, this idea is as a, as a, a man of God, you are to handle your, your money well, so as to provide for your family, and if possible, your family's family's family, right? This idea is to be wise with it. Don't be, uh, don't be selfish. Be content, right? Invest in things. We're, we're doing a lot of um, twisting at this point, which is troubling, because again, the first half was good. Let, let's keep going. I mean, we're, let's just, we're already destroying things. Let's just keep wrecking it. If he doesn't, fine. Don't be. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 4. Poor is the one who works. I'm sorry. Poor is the one who, <laughs> poor is he who works with a diligent hand. But the, Oh, I'm sorry. It's not diligent. It's negligent. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. What's the goal of this proverb? The hand of the diligent makes rich. The goal is to be rich. No. <laughs> My goodness, bro. Okay. 
Now, obviously, this is going to be worded a different depending on your translation. ESV says, a slack hand causes poverty, but a hand of diligence makes rich. Right? We're contrasting things here. Lazy equals poverty. Diligent equals riches. The idea is that if you're lazy, don't expect any money because you ain't worked for it. If you do work, you're going to get something for it. So work. The idea isn't riches. It is don't be lazy. That's the point of this po- this particular um, the, the, this particular verse in general. Again, there's a lot of you could go with the verse before it as well. But if you're going with just for, don't be lazy. Do something. Proverbs twenty one seventeen. He who loves pleasure will become poor. He who loves wine and oil, wine and oil will not become rich. What's Proverbs trying to teach you? How to become rich. Oh my goodness, the twisting. Whoever loves pleasure will become a poor man. Yes, if you spend all your money on pretty things that make you happy now, you're not going to have any later. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich, right? This idea is if you spend it all on 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 wine or things that make you happy now, you're not going to have any later, right? This this is not the goal is not to be rich. The goal is not to be lazy. The goal is to be to to be purposeful in what you do, not lazy and to be diligent and discerning on how you spend your money. This is not about riches. This is about being smart. This is about not being lazy. This is about being purposeful in your finances. He is twisting things like crazy, which is, is can I just say, I, if you're still with me, thank you for being here for an hour and 20 minutes so far. We've still got a lot to go. But he's, he's the first half was really good. It made you trust that he was able to interpret scripture well. The second half is crazy twisting. And I don't want to say it's purposeful. Maybe it is. But you were lured into thinking that he knew what he was talking about. So by the time we get to these verses, why should we not trust him? Because he handled these well. Well, he handled those well. He's destroying these verses. Deuteronomy 8.18. But you shall remember the Lord your God. This is God to Moses. Tell these people this. You shall remember the Lord your God. It is he who has given you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Now, I don't know if you've read the rest of that verse. God says, listen, I'm going to give the people, Moses, tell the people, I'm going to give them power to make wealth, and it will confirm my covenant with them. Well, listen, wealth isn't tied to spirituality, unless it is. Descriptive versus prescriptive. When the Israelites got wealthy, God said he was confirming his covenant of kindness to them. He specifically said, you guys are going to get wealthy, and it's going to confirm, I love you. No early church, no early church teaching teaches this. Well, what if I'm poor? Then be poor. I don't care, but don't tell me it's spiritual. Unless it is. (laughs) If God tells you don't, you know, be poor, you know, live sacrificially, you know, don't have anything, don't take a coat, you know, all of that. If he tells you to do that, then how many know that's spiritual? Then poor is spiritual, and we all honor that. <laughs> Isaiah 60, how many of you know Isaiah 60? Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Deep darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness of people. But the Lord will rise upon you, his glory will be seen upon you. Nations will come to your light. Kings to the brightness of your rising. Look all around, they all come to you. Your sons will come from afar, your daughters will be carried in arms. Then you'll see and be radiant, your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of seas turn to you. The wealth of nations will come to you. Wait, 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 it gets better. Verse 10, foreigners will build up your walls and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have compassion on you. Your gates will be open continually. What for? They will not be closed day or night, so that men will bring their wealth of the nations to you, their kings leading their processions. (laughs) That's just killing you. So I haven't, like, I'm sure there's a lot of really good exegesis to come from this passage about the fulfillment of this after the exile. Um, I would really have to dig into this, but my guess, I mean, again, what he's using it for is again, prescriptive over descriptive. It's, it's insane how he's, he, he clearly knows the difference, but he's not 
he's not exegeting the passage in a way to demonstrate what this prophecy is actually foretelling in regards to, uh, I, man, I'd have to really look into it. My guess is this is foretelling what happens after the exile. Spirituality isn't, con- isn't connected to wealth unless it is. Okay, now, turn to Matthew chapter 25. I want you to turn there. I'm going to show you something I learned this morning at 5.30. 6 o'clock in the morning. Verse 14. For it's just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted entrusted his possessions to him. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, according to to their ability. How did he give them? According to their ability. Got that? And he went on a journey. Verse 16, immediately the one who received five talents went out and traded them and gained five more talents. In the same way, the one who received two did the same thing, and the one who received one dug a hole, put it in the ground, his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came back and settled the accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came up and brought five more, saying, Master, you entrust me with five talents, Okay, what's the rest of the verse? Help me. See, I have gained five more talents. Did you see that? See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many, help me, things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the same thing happened to the guy who got two, and then he goes on to the one who got one. And those, um, and the one who had received I'm sorry, the one, um, verse 24. And the one who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and sowing and gathering where you did not spread seed. I I was afraid, and I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow, and I gathered where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put the money in the bank. And on arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. To everyone who has, did you see this verse 29? For to everyone who has, more shall be given. Did you get that? The rich get richer. And he who... So the... the, Let's let him finish. And he will have abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he has, shall be what? Taken away. And the poor get poorer. Now, let me just give you a little history lesson. Uh, So it's very interesting that he doesn't read verse 30. He stops. I mean, if we're going to read the entire context, verse 30 is a part of that. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right? So this idea is that there's a master that goes away, gives each talent to each servant, depending on their ability, comes back. And he, ha- he doesn't tell them in the parable what to do with this. He just gives it to him based on their ability. And he comes back and each, except the last one, has done something with what has been given to them via their ability to do so. The last one doesn't do anything because he's scared of the master. The master says, if you were really scared of me, you should have at least done something with what you did. But since you did nothing, I'm going to give it to somebody that does know how to do something with it. And then he is cast out. He is called lazy. Uh, where is that? Wicked, so not only is the person that did nothing with what they were given, wicked and slothful, they get thrown out into the outer darkness. There, there's a story or a, a purpose to be had here. He actually goes into, this is part of uh, final judgment. If you read into verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory with all the angels with him, then he will sit in, the, in his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from another uh, as a shepherd trip separates the sheep from the goats. So this parable is uh, connected to the final judgment. So this isn't just about talents. This is Jesus using a parable to talk about the final judgment in which everyone will give an account for what they've been given based on their ability. And he connects it saying that, hey, this is this is how you will be judged at the throne. So if you were given something, you should do something with that you have been given with. Again, it ties in to a lot of the Proverbs he's read before. Don't be slothful. Don't be neglectful. If you know God is going to demand something from you, you should do something with it. Um, 
this ties in to the, the other verses, but because he conveniently cuts off verse 30 and then doesn't connect it directly to the final judgment that Jesus talks about later in direct connection with this parable, he can make the parable say whatever he wants. This does not have anything to do with riches. This is, has something to do with faithfulness to what God has given you. Talent in that day was worth about $30,000. A mita was worth about $500. We're going to talk about the minas in just a minute. So the one guy, who, the guy who got one, he got about thirty thousand bucks. The guy who got two, he got about sixty thousand. The guy who got uh, five talents, he got about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. What happened with the guy who got five? He went out and made. He went out and made five more. And the guy who had two made two more. And the guy who had one hit it. Remember that? Okay. First of all, let me just say this: that a lot of things that are called stewardship are just fear. A lot of times what people call stewardship is just being afraid. And I would just, you know, this is not in the Bible. This is just my own thoughts. But, you know, sometimes we're so, we look at what we have and we look at what other people have been given that, you know, hey, you know, the least other guy has double what I have. And that guy's got five times what I have. And we're so enamored by what we don't have that we forget what we have. And it... (laughs) And we, 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 get, we get afraid and paralyzed, and we, we, we end up being afraid to lose what we've been given because we don't know how we made it, how to make it, because it was given to us. Let's see, I didn't do that very well. The problem with an inheritance is that if you don't learn how the guy who gave you the inheritance got the money to give you, then you feel powerless, and you either spend the money foolishly, or you spend all your life being afraid you're going to lose the money, because you don't know how to make it. That's not what the parable's talking about. The guy that doesn't do anything with the talent that he's given is because the, he's scared of the master. And he thinks that if he at least just keeps what he was given, then he'll be okay. I mean, he's foolish and wrong about that, but that's his thought process, is that he doesn't... He, he, It doesn't matter how the master made it. He's just scared of the master, and he figures that if he keeps on to at least what the master gave him, he'll be okay. But he's not faithful with what he's been given, and therefore it's taken away. This what again? What I mean? Luckily, he did say it was his own thought, but it's a worthless thought because it's not connected to the text at all. (laughs) The next thing I want to say is wealth attracts wealth. If you're poor, you'll attract more poverty. <laughs> if you're rich, you'll attract wealth. And people say it all the time, right? They say, you know, it's just the, the rich get richer and the poor get poor. Yeah, Jesus said, that's the way I designed it. People that are faithless, that don't want to take a risk, that are lazy, they get poor. So much for communism. So much for socialism. Okay, I could get political in a minute, but I won't. Somebody once said, if you divided all the money in the world up equally so that everybody in the world got the exact same amount of money, in five years, the people who were, who were once rich will be rich again. The people who were once poor five years from now will be poor again. And the people who are middle class will be middle class. You know why? Because wealth tends to be a manifestation of personhood. I said... That's not entirely wrong. I mean, how you've been taught to treat money based, not only treat money, but just go again, the Proverbs, let's just say that the Proverbs that he already read that he twisted. If you apply those correctly, you'll, you'll be okay. Said tends to listen, if you're poor, you're poor, but listen, if you need money, don't ask for money. Ask why you need money. And it might just be that you need money. I told you about our journey. You know, I know what it is to be broke. I, I grew up poor. I grew up on welfare. I, I'm not preaching at somebody. I'm telling you my story. And I just I got done telling you that I spent 25 years of my married life sabotaging any kind of wealth that would come into my life because I thought it was evil and wrong. And, you know, I, I made fun of every, you know, prosperity teacher. So, and I, I don't consider myself a prosperity teacher, but I certainly am a steward teacher. Okay, so that's interesting. He doesn't consider him as prosperity, himself a prosperity teacher, but 
how he just twisted those verses is exactly how prosperity teachers would twist those verses. It sounds to me that Chris, in an effort to undo some weird things that he picked up in his childhood, instead of just dealing with them, uh, has then now tried to use the scripture as a lens to make himself not feel like he has to be poor all the time. And in so doing has now twisted the scriptures to make himself feel better about having lots of money. There's ways to do that without twisting all of those things, right? I mean, again, the Proverbs that he read are really helpful. Don't be lazy work, right? Uh, don't be don't be throwing your money at things that aren't going to be good investments and you'll have money later. Like there's, like the Proverbs are full of really good, helpful things to explain how God has set up the world. And if you operate in God's way, in general, you'll you'll be okay. And if Jesus said, I want to make you wealthy, I'm like, kill me with kindness. <laughs> Turn to Luke chapter 11, nine, uh, sorry, Luke chapter 9, nine, start over, Luke chapter 19, verse 11. This is the story of the minas. Now, what's really interesting is a mina is $500. Okay, a talent is how much? 30000 But a mina is what? $500. Now, look at this story. I used to think these were identical stories with two different amounts of money. And this morning, I'm reading these stories, and I felt like the Holy Spirit opened my mind to the place where I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to write my next book about this. I, I, hope it opened, I hope this really helps you. Verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near to Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Stop for a minute. You understand the Old Testament eschatology was that the Messiah was going to come back, set up his kingdom, and rule the world. So they didn't have any, they didn't know there was a first coming and a second coming. So Jesus is going towards Jerusalem. They're throwing down palm branches, and they're, they think they're making Jesus king. That's why, you know, that's why the disciples are asking, can we sit on your left and right hand in the kingdom? They're not thinking in the kingdom like heaven. They're thinking now. This is Jewish eschatology. Are you with me? So this is interesting because this is right. Like this is like this is why like Chris knows his Bible. That's not the confusing part. So it's it's so strange to me that he seems to be incredibly well educated in regards to the scriptures, what he's talking about here as far as Jewish eschatology. Like he knows this stuff. So how is he not using descriptive versus prescriptive text? Like it's just really strange. I mean, it's an honest question. I don't know how he doesn't see that he's doing that when he clearly knows what he's talking about most of the time. With me? So he's on his way to, to Jerusalem, and they think the kingdom's going to come immediately. And he tells them a parable to show them that the kingdom is going to come progressively. Did you get that? So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country. Who's the nobleman that's going to a distant country? Jesus. Jesus to receive a kingdom for himself, and then return. And he called ten of his slaves, and he gave them ten minas. And he said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated them, sent a delegation after him, say, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered these slaves to whom he had given the money to be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. Okay, stop for a minute. Okay, you'll notice in the parable of talents, he gave one, three, no, one, two, and five, and that he gave them according to their ability. Why? It was a lot of money. Got me? He gave them according to their ability, but he didn't give these guys different amounts. He gave them all 500 bucks. Are you following me? Okay, now it says, when he returned, the first appeared to him saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said, well done, good and faithful slave, because you are faithful with the very little, you will have authority over 10 cities. Did you see that? The second came saying, your mind and master has made, your, your mind and master has made five minas. And he said to him, you are over five cities. Another came said, he buried the man. Okay, let me just stop right there. I want you to notice something. In the parable of the talents, did you notice that they, the, the, each slave came to the master and said, I have made, you have gave me, you have given me five talents, and I have made five more. And what did the slaves that made the talents, made more talents, what were they put over? More stuff. 
more things. Are you with me? Yeah. How did they make the money? They said, Master, I have made five more. Did you notice in the parable of the minas that they said, your minas have made more minas? What did they get? They got to be over cities, not over stuff. You know why? Because one guy, one guy learned how to make money. The other guy, the other guys learned how to create an ecosystem in which the money makes money. Again, this is about faithfulness in every regard and reward for faithfulness. It is about being shrewd. This is about knowing God is over all of it. Like if 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 we're talking in master servant terminology, even when they say I have made he, you're his servant, so it's his anyway, right? He could take it. So like it's 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 just terminology being used here as far as I made these things or your mina has made. It's it's the master's anyway, like in both in both parables, it all belongs to the master anyway. And so the core of both of these is faithfulness. It's not about the the money in it. It's about the faithfulness of the servant that did it and the reward the servant gets. Now, again, this right here, um, yeah, this right here doesn't then go into a telling about the uh, the final judgment. This just stops and it goes in verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem when they knew drew near drew to Bethsaidage and Bethany and the Mount called Olive. He sent two disciples saying, go into the village. So this doesn't go into a teaching about the coming judgment. This just says, Hey, this is the faithfulness you should have. And it seems to be again, what the, what Chris did point out before is that, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell them because he was near Jerusalem and they thought um, the city was coming. So there is context before this that we didn't get into, uh, apparently about Zacchaeus as well. So there, there's, again, th this is why, the reason I'm like, uh, what does this have connection to? Because this is why context is important. When we get to verse 11 and say, as they heard these things, what did they hear? <laughs> Obviously, it's in some direct connection to them think as they came new to Jerusalem, they thought the kingdom of God was near. So then he tells them this parable. All of this is important. Again, the parable itself is about the faithfulness of the servants in the story. So it, again, exegesis is so important. Context is so important for you to understand what's going on. And if you don't have those two things... You can anybody can pull whatever they want out. I am so sorry. We are about ten minutes away from being done here. I know we're near two hours on this sermon review. Thank you. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you sticking around. See, when you can teach your money how to make money, now you can create ecosystems in which, if money, listen, master, your mina has made more minas. How many of you understand that if you can create ecosystems of prosperity, now you can be over cities? Because if you can do that with money, then you can do that with cities. This is the only place in the New Testament in which it tells you how to actually pastor a city. It says, if you can learn how to create wealth, you understand that there's a power to create wealth. Most people spend their life working for money. This, these guys learned how to make money work for them. They learned the secret of the power of money. The money worked for them. They didn't work for the money. I wonder if Chris had to take Tylenol after this. Because, I mean, he is twisting over backwards to make this say something it doesn't say. In the parable of the talents, they work for the money. In the parable of the miners, the money worked for them. Are you following me? And what I'm getting at is this. Did you notice that the first guys and the talents, story of the talents, they got thousands of dollars, 30,000, 60,000, 150,000. But the guy in the, in the story of the minas actually only got $500. How many know it's not what you have, but what you do with it that matters? You look at people that grew up in a wealthy home and you're like, I'll never have what they have. Yes, but you take your 500 bucks and you teach your 500 bucks how to make bucks. And pretty soon God goes, you know what? You're so good with money, you should have authority over people. You'll teach people how to reproduce themselves. If you can teach money how to reproduce itself, you can teach people how to reproduce itself. You should be over a city. How about 10 of them? 
Well, that's a lot more powerful than you're thinking right now. I laid on the couch for about 15 minutes thinking my mind was totally blown this morning. I'm like, oh my God, this is the secret of prospering cities. This is he's just pulled something completely out of his butt here is what he's done. Like both of these passages are about a master that the servants know can be harsh and the ones that are faithful are faithful with the things that they're given so as to give back to the master in their faithfulness to him. The ones that are dishonest and lazy don't do anything with it, thinking that they can bury it and basically the master be happy because at least he got back what he's done and they're unfaithful in what he gives them. In the first example, the one gets cast out into outer darkness and Jesus uses that parable to then therefore talk about the judgment seat. This one seems to be about uh, in connection with them thinking that the kingdom is coming. So it's still connected to him being the king. And he says, hey, if, if, if you, you're thinking I'm the king that is to come in this way, which he is the king to come, but it's not going to happen in the way you think it's going to happen. But you're supposed to be faithful in the things that I give you. Uh, there's a whole lot more there. Again, I know we're just ignoring exege exegesis here. Um, but there's a whole lot more here in uh, this passage, especially verse 14, that we're not even um, we're not even going to talk about clearly. Um, that that really reveals the purpose of the parable way more than the money here. But yeah, I mean, sure, let's just lay on the couch and come up with some random fake prophetic utterance. Sure. This is the secret right here of prospering cities that money makes money. This is the difference between rich people and wealthy people. Rich people have money. Wealthy people have an ecosystem that reproduces more wealth. Henry Ford said, take all, of my, take all my factories and burn them down. Take every possession I have and take it from me. Steal it, burn it, and give me back my employees. And in five years, I'll have everything back again because the things you see around me are already in me. Yeah. Being faithful what you have and not lazy. We've already talked about with the parables. Something happens when you learn how to make wealth, not money. Yeah. I have five minutes. I want to give you eight differences between rich people and wealthy people i'll just give them to you quickly i probably are these going to be biblical or are these going to be things that he's thought of that is the real question i won't comment on any of them rich people get their identity from their things they own their houses cars yachts money wealthy people's identity comes from who they are not what they own number two rich people either spend a lot of time trying to not lose their money or waste it on themselves Wealthy people's money is just an expression of who they are, so they are not cont they, they are content. Start over. Wealthy people's money is just an ex expression of who they are, so they are content in their well-being. Number three, rich people work for money. Wealthy people's money works for them. Number four, rich people think their assets. No, rich people think of their assets, while wealthy people dream of their legacy. Number five. Rich people give to people. Rich people give to people. Wealthy people invest in people with an expectation of return on investment measured by a predetermined outcome. Examples are a changed life, a transformed neighborhood, a business profit. I'd like to read that again. Rich people give to people. Wealthy people invest in people with an expectation of a return on investment measured by a predetermined outcome. Examples are a life change, a transformed neighborhood, a, a business profit. That's a good word. Number six, rich people think their money protects them. They have a sense of being above the law. Solomon put it like this, a rich man's wealth is like a strong city, like a high wall in his own imagination. Wealthy people are inherently humble because they are thankful, knowing that the source of their provision is the Lord. Number seven, rich people have a vision for the things they can buy. Wealthy people have a vision for the legacy they can leave. Number eight, most, most rich people, um, sorry, most rich people's money was given to them. They received an inheritance, won a lottery or a lawsuit, got lucky in a stock market. Therefore, they don't know how to reproduce it, how to make more. This creates a lot of insecurity in their souls. 
Wealthy people have wisdom and power to create wealth. Therefore, they live with confidence and aren't afraid of the future. Would you stand? I would just like to note that absolutely none of those except like number six even mentioned Jesus. I'll just, just let him finish and then we'll kind of sum this whole thing up. No, I'm going to ask you in just a minute, don't do it yet, to put your hand on your heart if you want to be wealthy. Now, if you don't want to be health, wealthy, please don't put your hand on your heart. Because I am absolutely very serious about this. So if you want to be wealthy, I want you to put your hand on your heart. I didn't say rich. I'm not praying for anyone to get rich. I'm only praying for you to become wealthy. I just explained to you some of the differences. Are you with me? Yes. So I want you to become wealthy, not rich. So if, if you don't want wealth, please don't put your hand on your heart. You just screw up your whole life and have to live rejecting people. This is utterly devoid of the gospel. So Father, I just pray right now, you told me this morning that you wanted to teach me the principles of riches because you want to change the world, and that takes money. And so I pray right now that every single person that's watching by Bethel TV or that's in this room that has their hand on their heart right now, I just pray, I pray right now that, that you, what you said in Deuteronomy, that you had given the people money to make wealth as a sign of your covenant of kindness towards them. So I pray right now for the covenant of Moses and the covenant of Abraham, that you would release, that you would release wealth. I mean, let's here. Here's something I just wanted. Like, look at these people. Hold on. Where's the, look at these people? How many people are are like, yes, I want the wealth, right? It's not I want faithfulness. I want to be faithful. I want the wealth that you've been talking about this whole time, Chris. Yes, I know we haven't. We haven't talked about Jesus a single time in regards to salvation, and we've completely ripped text out of Scripture, especially on the second half. But yes, this is ridiculous. On your people, not money, the ability to make wealth, that money would make money, that friends would make friends, that prosperity would make prosperity, that you would cause everybody, in the sound of my voice, that wants to be wealthy, Lord, I pray that you would release wealth on them. I pray that you release wealth that they don't hang on to, that they don't get their identity from, that they, that they don't, that, that they're not afraid they're going to lose. And I pray that we would all be, unlike the, the rich young ruler, that we would actually be willing to give up whatever it is you want us to give up, knowing that you'll just give it to us again. No, that's the truth. That's not, that's, not what, that's not what, oh my goodness, two things. When Paul is talking to Timothy, it's not for them to pray for riches. It's that if you are, if you are wealthy, then do with, it, be generous with it. It belongs to the Lord anyway, right? That's the thing. Also, there's no, there's nothing in the rich young ruler. Um, we I preached a sermon on this. I will try to remember to link it below that it's it's because people will try to be read the rich young ruler the whole the whole thing which he didn't but he's he's talking about there's verses at the end that it says that anyone that leaves his brother his mother his father all of these things i'll give you more at the end and he he adds persecutions onto it and that's really important to again exegete the text um and not just be like oh well if you give it all up you'll get even more back uh, that's what he's referring to that's what he's referring to but that he's when you don't use context and execute the text well, you, you are able to literally say whatever you want. You'll just give it to us again. Lord, I just released that on every one of us. I break the fear, the fear of poverty. I break the fear of it. I break the fear that if I, if I give away something, then I'll have less. I break that thing right now. You have a very wealthy daddy who loves to give good gifts to people who aren't fearful and lazy. Daddy God, he's got lots of money for you. You just got to ask for it, you know. And Lord, I break off that teaching of grace that causes us to not work hard. Because you said we were created for good works in Christ Jesus. And you said that we're to work with all of our heart, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. So Lord, I just release that on us right now, that we would be like the good servant in Proverbs, that we would work and that you would prosper us and that our children's 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 children would benefit from this message tonight in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Thank you so very much. Okay. Let's, let's go through that really quick. Yeah, it, It's like that meme where it's like, you had me on the first half. You had me on the first half. Because the first half wasn't bad. If you stop that sermon at about like 30 minutes, it's not too terrible. It's that second half. It's the going up the mountain was pretty good. And the coming down the other side was real rough. So let's go through this. When did he read the text? Ah, uh, depending on what text you're talking about, I don't think we fully read. We might have fully read one or two of the texts in the sections that he's talking about. Maybe the closest we got, I think, was the parable of the talents in which he still left off that end verse, verse 30, which was very crucial because it connects it to the following point. But no, we didn't really read the text. We jumped around a lot, didn't give any context or culture, which is the second thing. We completely devoid of context and culture for the most part. Like we all know what a mina is and a talent is now. Hooray for us. But that's not really that's sort of uh, pointless if we don't know the point of the text or what's happening and what Jesus is trying to communicate, uh, what the Proverbs were trying to communicate or descriptive versus prescriptive. We've completely just went, we don't need any of that. So no, context and culture we didn't need uh, or we didn't use at least in any of this sermon. And the last thing, and I would say probably the most important thing, is that we didn't even, we were like, the gospel, who needs, who, who needs the gospel? We're talking about money, bro. Like, we don't need to hear about Jesus' life, death, resurrection. We don't need to hear about reconciliation had in him. What are you talking, where do you think you're at, church? No, we didn't cover that. You know, I had a lot of hope. I, I I had a lot of hope in that first 30 minutes. I thought, man, am I going to be proven wrong? I really thought, man, it's like that first 30 minutes. I was like, there's not a whole lot I could say. Like, it's he's right. Contentment over wealth. Like, he's not, he's not wrong. And then he was just like, hold my beer. I'm going to set this whole thing on fire. There you go. I don't... I don't know if you watch the whole thing without my commentary link below. If you want to support what we do here, links below. If you love it, hate it, whatever, leave a like. You know, the algorithm and all that good stuff. I'll talk to you later.